old You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Great episode of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. Oh, and Jim, don't turn off your TV. You do see milk, and Jim's going to tell you why. <laughs> Tonight's show, we could call Two Guys and a Lot of Milk, but actually we're going to call this Body Basics. And this idea comes to us from one of our viewers. So I want to thank Beth from Hebron, Connecticut for contacting us and asking why we always talk about legs when we're looking at wine. And yeah, not lady legs. No. Wine not legs. And this is one of our big pastimes, though. We're, we're constantly swirling the glass and looking at the legs on the glass before we actually drink the wine. And we're doing that to determine how much body the wine has. So, Beth, I just want you to know, this is something important, and you should pay attention to it. Yeah, and actually, this is something we've never done on the show. I've actually never done something quite like this to show the difference in the legs, which we'll see in some of the bottles of wine we have tonight. So it's kind of exciting and a little bit scary. I generally don't drink a lot of milk viewers, so this is going to be kind of scary. Usually it's more wine. So, so yeah, Jim, well, let's, uh, what's our first uh, thing we're doing here? Well, this is going to be a fun little experiment. Um, body, when you think about it, is really that kind of sense of uh, richness or uh, viscosity in the mouth. And you can get this from milk as well as wine. Uh, when you do this with milk, what you're tasting is the, the fat content in the milk. And so we're going to do a progression. We're going to go from 1% milk to whole milk to heavy whipping cream. And you can do this experiment at home too. Uh, if you don't have uh, low fat milk, you can use a skim milk. Uh, but what you wanna do is move from a lighter milk to a mid-weight milk and then to something with a lot of fat in it and the heavy whipping cream is gonna fill the bill there. And once again, this is a good experiment to do, especially if you're just getting into wine and you don't know the difference between some of the lighter and heavier wines. Exactly. This will give you at least a viewpoint as to what you're seeing when it comes to wines. Exactly. So, so let's start off with the 1%. And this is going to be a very kind of weak, watery milk. Now, we're not going to be rating the taste of the milk no. on this show. This is just to get a contrast between a very light, watery, uh, almost no viscosity. Nothing there. It's almost like water. Yeah. You know, I actually smelled it before I drank it. So it's, so, it's sort <laughs> it's of ingrained in your, in your head. But uh, yeah, it's right. It's basically water with a little bit of milk flavor. But um, yeah, it's, but very thin, extremely yep. thin. And then when you move on to whole milk, uh, this will be a little creamier. Uh, it'll fill the mouth a little bit more. You get more texture with this. Yep. Kind of coats the tongue a little bit better. And once again, I know this seems basic to some of you, but really, this really is a good way to understand wine because wine is so much when it comes to the body of a wine is very similar to this experiment we're doing here tonight. Yeah, that's the whole point of this exercise is to, to demonstrate this with something that people are familiar with. Um, everybody's been drinking milk their whole life. So um, if you're new to wine and body is, the body is kind of throwing you off a little bit or you, you don't quite understand the concept, this is a great way to try and uh, anticipate what's going to happen in your mouth. Let's go ahead and move to the heavy whipping cream. And this is the one that's going to just cling to the tongue. It's going to stay there for quite a while. I can actually say I have never drank just heavy whipping cream like this. Usually it was either in coffee or was part of a whipped cream. So the, now, <laughs> this is something I've never done before either. But And when you look at this in the glass, it's the just like shake. with legs with, yeah, with uh, wine. It's, it's clinging to the glass. It's, uh, it's not moving at all. So. And that really does fill wow. the mouth, doesn't it? It does really fill the mouth. And it... This is great because there are wines that do this exact same thing. Mm -hmm. At this level of viscosity, there are wines that will just coat your mouth just like that. And that's what we're going to try now is the wine um, and see how we go from a, a light body wine all the way up to a heavy wine. Now with, with the milk, 
uh, what was creating all that body was fat in the milk. With wine, uh, what creates the body is the alcohol content. So a uh, wine with a lower alcohol content is going to have a lot less body and a lot less legs when you're swilling it in the, in the glass. That's generally the, the rule, right? Yes. That's always the case, generally. Yeah. It's, um, it's a couple of different factors that go into the body, but it's mostly the alcohol content. Uh, it's also the sugar content of the wine, uh, any kind of oak that comes in the wine, and um, uh, some of the tannins, uh, the, the concentration of, of uh, fruit and tannins in the wine. So those can contribute to body, but for the most part, body comes from the alcohol content. And we'll be doing three wines that uh, Jim's picked out one. I actually had two. I forgot it, folks. Sorry. But these three wines are a good example of what we're going to do. This be. is going to be an excellent progression. And if you want to try this at home, uh, start off with a, a light Pinot Grigio. Uh, that was the one that we forgot tonight. Um, and we'll get that. It was such a great bottle. We'll get that one on a future show and figure out how to work it into a topic there. But, uh, but if you want to do this at home along with us, uh, start off with a Pinot Grigio. That's going to be a very watery texture. Uh, it will have almost no body at all. If you swirl it in the glass, it's not going to have any legs. It's going to immediately just go back down into the, the bowl. Uh, but we're going to move on to a Valpolicello. Uh, this is a very light Italian wine. American drinkers tend to skew towards Pinot Noirs if they want something lighter. Uh, so the Val Valpolicello is a, a rarer wine for American consumers. Uh, but there, there are a lot of great Valpolicellos out there. Um, and we're going to do a whole show on Valpolicellos at some point in the future. Uh, but when you look for these in the store, there are actually five levels of Valpolicello. Uh, the lightest is a Classico, and that's what we're drinking tonight. Uh, and you can move all the way up to a very heavy, well, a medium uh, Valpolicello or a dessert wine. There's um, no question this is light. I mean, that's uh, not many legs going on in this glass. Right. When you, when you look at it uh, in the glass, it's, it's just going right back down in the bowl almost immediately. And another reason that's important, Jim, is because if somebody wants a wine like this with very minimal legs, they might be wanting to pair this type of wine or their first experience with a low leg wine with a different type of meal as compared to one of the heavier ones that we'll get to later. In exactly. The and that, that brings up another great rule of thumb. Uh, if you're doing a, a food pairing with wine, a lot of times you do want to pay attention to body and get a light bodied wine with a lighter food. Uh, and a, you know, a great food with this um, would be um, probably a polenta cake with a little bit of mushroom and some gorgonzola. Um, you could do a seared tuna with this. Definitely um, not a heavy meat, though, like no, a steak or something. No, that, that would that would crush this wine. So that would be a you know that would be a bad pairing. Although to go back to one of my first uh, rules of thumb, you know, drink what you like. So if, if you want, if you love Valpolicello and you're having steak for dinner, go ahead and do it. Uh, just keep in mind that's not the ideal pairing. It is not, but I won't know because I'm just about to have my first Valpolicello. Well, so give it a shot. I'm going to give it a shot. It has a very mild nose. It does. That's very interesting. It has sort of a, an acidity there at first, but it does smooth out a little bit mm -hmm. uh, when it hits the back of your throat, yep. at least for me. So I, I, I can see what you mean by, I mean, I personally couldn't pay the, pair this with a steak, I don't think, because it's just a little too, uh, um, is fruit forward the way to, you would say? That's a good description for this. I would say fruit forward a little bit, but not overly fruity. And I have a feeling that having just consumed three glasses of milk, uh, our, our palate has changed quite a bit. And I, th I think this would have a lot more bite if we had tried it without the milk. I'm still smiling, folks, because it's, we, we're talking about milk here and two guys, a lot of wine. <laughs> and it's just kind of humorous at the same time. It's a great way to point out what we're talking about. But I think you're right. This is a, um, it's an interesting wine. Probably would definitely pair really well with some of the food groups that you just mentioned. And it's also one of the lighter reds I've seen in a glass. Yeah. And, you know, one other great recommendation for a food pairing uh, was swordfish. And I honestly, I, I could see that. I don't eat swordfish very often, but, you know, it's a very uh, thick fish. Uh, but I could see this, this pairing very well with the swordfish. Now, quickly, where was the history? Of, how did you find this one? And what's the price point roughly about this? Uh, honestly, I've, this is my first time having this wine also. Um, you'll find this in the stores for probably around 18 to 22 dollars which is a little high it's a little high um you know bob and i like to drink wines that are under 20 dollars on this show uh, so this is right up at the uh, the top of that price point um i don't oh, i'm sorry Jim. we should say this is also should be served chilled excellent point i'm glad you reminded me about that Rarely do you serve red wines chilled, but the Valpolicello is one of the exceptions. Um, and I've, I've put a slight chill on this one for tonight, uh, so you can taste, you know, right now it's got 
a little bit of cool. Yeah, it's definitely cooler than room temperature here in the studio. And actually, I'm, I'm very curious as the show progresses and we have time to go back to it, if it's changed at all character-wise in the flavor. I know it's not going to get any heavier, hmm. but just flavor-wise, if it's going to be different. See if it opens up a little yeah. bit more. I don't know if I want this to open up. I sort of like it the way it sort of is right now. It's drinking pretty well right now. And it's another example of Italian wines, per se, always being somewhat enjoyable. What I've always found is that Italian wines go best with food. And this is especially true of uh, the Sangiovese and the Chianti. You know, if you're drinking them by themselves, they usually don't stand up very well to the American palate because we're used to a lot of fruit. And, and you don't get a whole lot of that with Chianti or Sangiovese. Um, you're getting a little more fruit with the Valpolicello. Mm. Um, I'm getting a little bit of cherry with this. I wouldn't say cherry. Well, you know what? On that second or third sip, probably fourth, I do see a little bit of the cherry. It, it hides. It does hide. It's sort of like a pop tart, cherry pop tart light. <laughs> yeah. Which you should never buy light pop tarts. If you're going to buy a pop tart, just buy a regular freaking pop tart. But uh, I, I like this. I really do. I, I think this is an interesting wine, and I think I, I might have to add it to my repertoire for future. Uh, Get together. This is certainly something I would consider uh, serving to guests if, I, you know, if we're doing another wine dinner and we've got uh, multiple wines to go through in the evening, I would throw this into the mix. This is a great, uh, great topic. That... I, I will say, Jim, quickly mm -hmm. that if you're going to use this for a gathering and the chilling is an issue, just keep that in mind, how you're going to serve that, how you're going to store it while you're entertaining. Good point. Yeah, if you're, yeah, if you're planning a picnic, um, you're not going to have an ice chest with you. This might not be the best choice to take with you. Um, on the other hand, you could chill it a lot um, and then take it with you. It'll, it'll be at the right temperature when you get to your picnic destination. That might harm the fruit, though, getting it that cold. True. So that's, I know that's one of the things you've mentioned in other shows. You can't drink any wine too cold because yeah. you're, you're going to lose all the flavor profile, yeah. everything from it. So, um, Great first choice and great example of uh, the light milk or the low-fat milk and the light red. Yeah, and you notice, to get back to the body, how this just kind of washes over your tongue and then dissipates. It's gone. Yeah. There is no lingering finish to this. Uh, it's, it's not clinging to the tongue at all during uh, the, the process of, of going down your throat. It's just, it's in your mouth and it's gone. Yeah, and that, that's one aspect of a red wine that sometimes I like. Sometimes I want it to be lingering in my mouth saying, welcome, you know, I'm a great wine. And other times I just want it to go down nice and easy. Yep. And this is one of the ones that says hello and moves on. Yep. So I sort of like that aspect of it. It's uh, very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Well, let's, let's move on to the Chardonnay now. The Chardonnay is going to be interesting again because in general, Jim and I have different opinions on Chardonnay, but I've never had this one. I haven't either. So again, this is, I'm breaking my rule. I know I, I always say try it before you buy it, and I've broken that rule twice tonight. Uh, well, you know, Jim, that's what life's all about, breaking some rules. And we break them off all the time over here. So, uh... so again, to go back to tonight's topic of body, uh, the, the Chardonnay grape is actually the heaviest bodied white wine you're going to have. Uh, if you think about the scale, you're going to have Pinot Grigio at the very light end, uh, Sauvignon Blancs would be in the middle, and then Chardonnay would be a, a very heavy white. And in a lot of cases, uh, Chardonnay can be heavier in body than a Pinot Noir or a Valpolicello. And that's why we're drinking these out of order tonight. You know, normally when you do a wine tasting, right. you drink whites first and then you move on to reds. Uh, and tonight, we're, because we're going through the progression in terms of body, we started with a Valpolicello and moved on to the Chardonnay. And then we're gonna finish up with the red Zinfandel. It's funny, because I, I know when we've gone to wine tastings in the past, we've seen people start off at the red table and we sort of make fun of them. Like, why are you starting off with red? But this is an example of you want to do what we're doing here if you're going to do this at home or on your own to get the different characteristics. I have a feeling, and some people that go to wine tastings, you know, they, they jump right at the reds because either that's what they're comfortable with or it's what they prefer to drink. And then, you know, if they, if they get done with the reds and they still feel like tasting a few more wines, maybe they'll move on to some whites, which aren't their favorites. Um, and that's just my guess. Yeah, you could be right. I've never actually interviewed these people. <laughs> Generally, we're too busy making snide remarks about them from the distance. So I don't judge. <laughs> well, I, I do. do not judge. <laughs> All right. So right off the bat, nice legs on this one. Yeah. Uh, you can see it clinging to the glass. You probably can't see it, but if you can, uh, actually you might because this is high definition, right? You know, WHU-TV yeah. is high definition. So uh, there's definitely more character going on in this. 
And this, this should cling to the tongue a lot longer than the Valpolicello. This should be a much heavier wine than what we just had. It has that similar Chardonnay aroma. It does. I get, you know, there's some, some floral notes and, and a buttery, buttery characteristic to it. Very interesting. I do get, in this particular, is this a stainless steel or oak Chardonnay, do you know? I don't know. If I had to guess, I'd say it's stainless steel. This is a little buttery, but I sort of find it very pleasurable. Mm -hmm. It's got just a hint of lemon and then kind of a, a toast after taste to it. And this is a California Chardonnay. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is one of those Chardonnays, which is why, you know, we've done Chardonnay shows, so I, I know we've been through this before, but I'm pleasantly surprised by this Chardonnay. Very easy drinking and not, uh, you know, a lot of those Chardonnays just kind of smack you right in the face, and I, which is something I don't prefer. Some people love that, um, but this is a, a, a so smooth. It's so easy drinking. Smooth, that's exactly, yeah. which surprises me for a Chardonnay because I really always go into tasting a Chardonnay thinking that it's going to be buttery or it's going to be something that I find a little bit too sweet for my taste. Mm -hmm. I've been blown away numerous times being wrong, by the way, and this is an example where I'm wrong. I yeah. just sort of like the buttery aspect of this one. It's not too over no. buttery. No, it's, it's almost like a kind of a popcorn buttery taste. You know, it's just a, a hint of butter, and not as opposed to the whole stick of butter being shoved in your mouth. This is an example of a kind of Chardonnay, I think, that um, as it gets a little colder, you know, September, late August, September, I can actually enjoy this chilled. In the summertime, I don't think I would enjoy this mm -hmm. in the dead of summer as too much. Too heavy. It might be a little too heavy yeah. if you're sitting outside. But if it's a little chill in the air, um, I think this is a really complimentary uh, Chardonnay. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to go back to the, the body theme that we're talking about tonight, there, there's a lot of weight to this. Uh, so we, you know, as we're drinking it, I can feel it just sitting on the tongue. We have a little visitor of a fly yeah. flying around in the studio. I, think I he hope wants he goes some for of the, the milk I think he wants the, the Chardonnay. The <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so what's the history on this one and what's the price point? Uh, this one, again, is about 18 to $22, depending on where you get it. Um, it's a, a vineyard from California, and they've won a couple of awards. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm, again, this is one that I have never had before. If, and I don't serve Chardonnays a lot when I do wine parties, but this is something, again, I'd throw into the mix. Uh, having tasted it tonight, I, I like it. And Yeah, I, a, once again, I, I, not to keep beating a dead horse, but I'm really pleasantly surprised that a buttery Chardonnay, and I have to classify this as slightly buttery, yeah. I'm really, in, I think it's really enjoyable. Yeah, it's a very mild buttery taste, but it's, it works. And if you're talking about, you want to think about some food pairings for this, um, this would work really well with uh, very creamy dishes like a, a mac and cheese or some kind of um, uh, pasta dish with uh, pecorino and um, some parmesan mixed in. Yeah, I can see that. Um, it's, it's, it will hold up to something that heavy. And if I had remembered or hadn't forgotten the Pinot Grigio, would we have put that one right after the Valpolicella? No, that, we would have had that one first. We would have done that one first. Yeah. And uh, like Jim said, the, the, the Pinot Grigio grape uh, is a very light grape. And very light, very, but it's easy drinking. And that's why a lot of people like it. Um, you know, they're not looking for a whole lot of fruit out of the wine or a whole lot of character uh, or even you know, acidity or sourness. Uh, they just want something easy drinking. And that's what the Pinot Grigio does. It's, uh, it's, it's a very easy sipping wine. It's great in the summertime uh, because you can get the Pinot Grigio very, very cold. You're not going to damage the fruit uh, because there's not a whole lot of fl fruit flavor to it. But there are some varying qualities of, of, of Pinot Grigio. Some can be pretty astringent, I think. Yeah. You know, if you get the really cheap stuff yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Some of it can be very bad. And then, you know, if you move up to the, the Santa Margarita, which is 20 plus dollars a bottle, that's a very good Pinot Grigio. Uh, but, it, you know, you're, you're paying a lot of money for it. And the old so. rule of thumb, at least for me, is that even a, 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 if it's not a great Pinot Grigio or even a Sauvignon Blanc, as it warms, it's going to be nasty. If it's a better quality, or at least, in my opinion, better quality Pinot Grigio or Sauvignon Blanc, even if it warms up a little, it's still going to taste good. Yeah. At least that's, that's my particular train of thought on it. So. Right, yeah. You prefer to drink them cold, but if, if they do warm up, you want something that's going to taste good at, at room temperature. Generally, they're not sitting in the glass long enough for Jim and I for it to get <laughs> room temperature anyway, so it's a mute point. But for you more responsible people, I think uh, you will notice a difference in flavor, and hopefully, if you get the better stuff, it's more pleasurable. Yeah. So, Jim, thumbs up on that. Really good. Two great picks. I lucked out tonight. So we're going to go into a, a Zinfandel. I, we have not done a lot of Zinfandels on this show. No. 
I know it's probably going to be one of those things. Well, first of all, there's not really a lot of Zinfandels to pick from in our local market. You might have maybe, by pick from, I mean at a price point that's accessible. Uh, the Rosenblum, though, uh, is known for their Zinfandels. They make a wide variety of Zinfandels. It's a California Zinfandel. And Jim, I told him earlier that I was going to surprise him. I had this one when we had our little excursion out with a bunch of people um, back in Barnstable. Five or six oh, years ago. Yes. Okay. And I saw the uh, <laughs> the Rosenblum on the on the wine list, and it said Zinfandel. I said, I'm going to try that because I've never really ordered a Zinfandel in a restaurant. Generally, I would never order a Zinfandel in a restaurant because if I haven't tried it, that was the bottle, same uh, vineyard, and I was quite surprised by how good it was. And this is their moderately priced one. This is in the uh, thirteen to fifteen dollar range. Okay. But this is the one that was on the menu. So, let's give it a shot. All right. And this should and be our heaviest tonight, right? It should be. And just for the viewers at home, uh, this is a red Zinfandel, not to be confused with white Zinfandel, which we don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so funny because we keep talking about rosés, too. And whenever I drink rosés, sometimes people think, well, that's a red Zinfandel. That's a, a, the, a the white Zinfandel. The white yeah. Zinfandel. No, no, yeah. no, no. That's completely different. Completely different. Well, the, the story, the backstory to that, and I'm getting way off topic here, but uh, the the original intent when they were making white Zinfandel was to make a rosé and they screwed up and they decided, you know what, we're going to market this anyway, but we're going to call it something different. And they it was Americans, right? When it they was. Tried to get into it the, was uh, out in California. That's right. They were trying to make a European style rosé and they messed up the process, the uh, fermentation process, and came up with something so incredibly sweet, but they said, you know what, we're going to sell this. And they found a market for it. Yeah. I'll, I'll give them credit for that. Unfortunately, but, ladies, you... <laughs> made that market burgeon for way too long. And, uh, but that's okay, we forgive you because, well, we just forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's give this a shot. Yeah, let's, this let's is a red Zinfandel. And you can smell this one right off the bat. I mean, this is really- That just, oh yeah, jumps right out of the glass. Definitely heavy legs on this. Yeah, that is, that is clinging and not going anywhere. Wow. You know, it's another example of why we love doing the show. Completely, the difference in flavor and the profile is so different from the first one, obviously. But this is the type of red that I can just sit back. If I smoke the cigar, which I don't, but I like the smell of it, just sit back and just drink this very mm -hmm. slowly. Yeah. This is really, really nice. Yeah, it's so thick, so rich, uh, so heavy on the tongue. But not overly sweet. No. It's not like a port or something like that where it might be a little too overpowering. Right. Right. And I actually went through a, a red Zinfandel phase for a while. This was, this was my go-to wine for uh, about a year and a half. And I found five or six of they were really favorites of mine. And I still continue to serve them from time to time today. Um, I, think, I think they compete very well with Cabernet Sauvignon uh, at a dinner party. You know, if you're trying to show off something with a lot of fruit and a lot of body, um, you, you're going to go something heavy, like a cab uh, or even a red Zinfandel. But does, the red Zinfandel, like you said earlier, does get overlooked quite a bit by sure the American does. consumer. Uh, we tend to steer m more towards the Cabernet Sauvignon. That's and even if you go into a, a fairly large liquor store, yeah, the Zinfandel section is tend to be small. It really is. It's, it's not as popular of a grape varietal as cabbed. And a lot of times they'll use what the Zinfandel is, is it a, as a mix, right? As a variety. They can, yeah, they can blend with this, and they often do. Um, and I've had some great uh, Zinfandel Merlot blends. Um, and, and again, you know, there's a whole other show we could do, just red Zinfandels. Well, that's the thing, Jim. You know, it's, it's, as the years go on and, uh, you know, get a new year coming up in several months, whatever. I know the summer's still going on, but I think if you add up all the wine we've tasted, it's got to be well over 120 or 130 bottles of wine. Just on the show. In the, yeah, well, yeah, just on the show. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing. And uh, we're still, we haven't even touched, really, all the different varietals. No. That, and possibly taste. No, we haven't. But uh, this is a, this is just as pleasurable as I remember it. I had this one maybe about a year ago, and actually before that, uh, the last time I had it was when we were on our little excursion down the Cape in Barnstable. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I just remembered it because I liked the bottle, and uh, when I had it at the restaurant, I said this is a really good Zin at a reasonable price. Of course, it wasn't a reasonable price at the restaurant because it's usually three times the actual yeah. price of the bottle. But yeah. I went out and looked for it and got it, and this is really enjoyable. And it's got such a long, lingering finish. I, I haven't had a sip for quite a while now, and I still have an intense plum taste in the back of my throat. I, I love this. Plum, that's, that's exactly yeah. where I was going to go with that. And a mild plum. Not yeah. Like a, yeah. Not like a really in-your-face plum. No. Sort of like a 
It's sort of like a retired plum. Exactly. It's very yeah, subtle. It's, plum's been around a while. He's retired, and that's sort of what we're getting here. So very good. So what would you serve this with? Oh, this is an easy one. I mean, if, if I'm serving this one, this would definitely be a cold weather. Not cold weather, maybe mid-fall, late fall. Um, if I was having people over, I would probably pair this with either uh, a pork tenderloin. Oh, yeah. That'd be or good. Um, any type of uh, a red meat. Or I could actually pair this with a pasta sauce, but maybe a vodka sauce. I, I wouldn't pair this with fish, obviously. But. No, this would be too much for the fish. Uh, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier. You want to kind of match the body of the wine with, with uh, how heavy or light the food is that you're eating. And I think fish would be much too light to go with this. So I, I know, obviously, our viewers know you're up in Boston now. And uh, when you get a chance to go out to restaurants or all your fancy formals, which you go to a lot of, what's the, what are they serving up there? Now, I know you went to a rosé tasting, which unfortunately I couldn't make. But uh, what's the big talk? What's the buzz up there? What's the yeah, rosés have been popular for the last couple of years. Um, you're still seeing a lot of those. And you're seeing even more rosés enter into the market. Uh, that's still a growing category. It's huge. Everybody's talking about rosés now. And what did we try to do two years ago at the West Hartford Gala? What did we try to push? We served rosé along with a couple of other varietals, yeah. and no one wanted to touch the rosé. No rose. one wanted to touch the rosé. Now, guess what? Everybody's looking at rosés. Finally. So, well, you know what? We could say we started the trend here in West Hartford. I think we should. I really do, because <laughs> nothing credit. irked me more that people weren't drinking our rosés. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this uh, the rosé market's really doing popular right now. And um, I think the Zinfandel market... For our viewers who haven't tried it, you should really go out and look at some because there's some interesting Zinfandels. Not a lot, mm -hmm. but I think that you'd be quite surprised about. Yeah, and it's you know just like any other varietal, you're going to find some bad ones, you're going to find some good ones. So you know, stick to my other rule of thumb: try it before you buy it. Uh, go to a lot of wine tastings. Uh, it, eventually, you'll find uh, somebody who's tasting a red Zinfandel, and when you find one you like, buy a case of it and just keep it on hand. Yeah, that's always the case. Buy a lot of it because sometimes even I only buy one or two bottles, and then you go back and it's it's not available. Yeah. So as our final two minutes are winding up here, is there what are the what are what's on your mind for uh, our coming shows? I know uh, you were talking about maybe having Veronica back. We're going to have a couple more guests. Uh, we're going to have to do boxed wines at some point in the future. We are going to have to do boxed wines. I've had people ask me about the boxed wines. And uh, I'm going to do a Valpolicello show. So we are going to do that. We're going to uh, we'll work that in. All at right, some point. I, I sort of like at that at some idea. point. So and I want to let people know that uh, you know, as Jim always says, uh, our shows are available. Yeah, if you want to watch us on uh, YouTube, um, the, back, the previous episodes of the show are on YouTube. They're also on whctv.org. And Bob, you've got an announcement. Uh, yeah, exciting, well, I, some, of, some of you probably already know WHCTV has updated their, um, their electronics and their webpage. You can now watch our show on iPads, on your smartphones, and, uh, which is always enjoyable, especially if you're out somewhere and you want to see an enjoyable show. You can watch us on demand right on your little iPad or iPhone. And Technology is great. We're enjoyable to watch on the big screen. Or the small screen. So it really doesn't <laughs> so make any difference. look good either way, huh? Yeah. So, so I want to thank me. Beth uh, from Hebron one more time for giving us our show topic tonight. And if uh, any other viewers have a topic for us or a question or comment that you want us to address on the show, please uh, friend us on Facebook and send us a message through Facebook. You can find us at Two Guys and a Lotta Wine. We spell Lotta, L-O-T-T-A. And we will happily do a whole show on your question. Yeah, actually, we need some ideas because, uh, you know, we have ideas, but we're always looking for ideas from our guests either our guests or our viewers. And that's always more enjoyable when uh, we get questions from our viewers that maybe we hadn't thought of ourselves. Yep. And cause we, we do think a lot, but we can't think of everything. <laughs> so uh, please feel free to give us some suggestions. So quickly, what is your favorite tonight? Uh, I've got to say, and this is a surprise, it's the Chardonnay. Ooh. I didn't think that was going to happen either. You might have hurt my feelings there <laughs> at the end. Uh, you know what? I'm going to, if I do a quick order, I'm going to stick to my Zinfandel, okay. then the Chardonnay, yep. then the Vapicella. Only okay. because the Vapicella was so light. Right. Um, yeah. But I, I think that's my order. I'm going to do Chardonnay, uh, then your red Zinfandel, and then the Vapicella. And I love the Vapicella. I'm not knocking it at all, but I, I've, I feel like uh, you and I are kind of in the same boat here where we both like wines with a lot of body. And so the, the lighter, weaker wines, you know, I'll try them. I enjoy them. Uh, it's usually not something you want to drink a whole lot of. Well, Jim, as always, it's great to have you back here in West Hartford. Thanks for coming down. Look Thanks forward for to seeing me. you again for another show. And as always, keep Jim and I in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.